All right. Uh, hello, everyone, wherever you are. I'd like to start by asking whether you can hear me or not. Can people give me a feedback on that? We've been having some technical problems. Any? I'm not seeing anybody. I'm seeing people say hi, but can you hear me? Yes, so people can hear me. So, Franck, okay, so we, we've been having a problem. Okay, 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 thank you, thank you. <laughs> we've been having a problem with Franck, who's on the phone. From the, yes, so Franck, people can hear me, and I guess they can hear you. Can you say a word? Yes, can, can you hear me? Okay, so it works for, so I'll keep the phone uh, online. So the communication is just between Franck and the rest of the world on the way, uh, on the inward way, but fortunately we can listen to Franck uh, on, on the outside. So you can say anything you want about him. He won't, he won't hear you. You can type anything you want. Sorry about the, the glitch. Um, it's, um, of course, uh, a pleasure to have Franck here. As we see, we're, we're still in kind of a beta version of this. I was a... Tim used me last week as a, as a guinea pig, and I guess I wasn't expecting to use Honk as a guinea pig too, but you know, you always need an N of two at least for a good experiment, so here we are. So before um, I introduce Honk, I just want to go over, over the format of the presentation for those of you who weren't, um, who weren't here uh, last week. Um, you can make comments as we talk, as, as Honk is, is talking uh, on the right there, and you also see a button ask a question, which um, is uh, obviously to ask questions, but you can vote on these questions. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll go through these questions in the order that, uh, that uh, people have, um, have most, um, have most um, uh, asked. Yes, I see there's an echo. It, it, won't, it won't stay, sorry, it's because I'm on the phone with Frank at the same time. So very briefly. Um, Frank is a professor of neuroscience at the Superman Mind Brain Behavior Institute in Colombia. So throughout his career, he's focused on the identification of the cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying uh, the development and the function of the brain with a particular interest uh, on the mammalian brain and on the cerebral cortex. Uh, and more recently, he's been uh, developing a very original and successful line of work aimed at uh, trying and uh, identifying species-specific uh, uh, programs that, that, that control emergence of, of species-specific functions. So Franck uh, is, uh, did his training in France at the Université Claude Bernard in Lyon. Uh, he obtained his PhD in 1997, then went um, to Arnie Van Gosch's lab back at the time in, uh, at John Hopkins for his postdoc and then hired uh, as an assistant professor um, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, then the Scripps. And uh, since uh, 2013, 13 he's now uh, in uh, New York City. So um, he's, uh, his, um, his research, of course, has been uh, published in, in, in the most prestigious uh, journals, and this has also awarded him, uh, well, not the journals themselves, but the quality of the research that has been made, a number of awards, the last being uh, the Roger de Spurbeck Foundation uh, Prize for, um, for mid-career senior scientists. So uh, before I, I, I give the, straight, the, the stage to Franck, those of you who know him, uh, Although also know he has a larger than life appetite for quite a few thing, things, including uh, music and jazz. So I guess New York City is a, is a paradise for that. Uh, he's also a huge, huge sports and nature, nature, nature lover, uh, which is probably less compatible with the life of, uh, in New York City. But I guess you don't live with comprom without compromises, although I guess compromising is not really your style. So. I'll let you um, think about that during the rest of your confinement with a, with a set of new resolutions for the weeks and months to come. So, Franck, it's really a, a real pleasure to have you here. Your talk is titled A Human-Specific Modifier of Synaptic Development, Cortical Circuit Connectivity and Function. And uh, we all look uh, forward to, to hearing about that. The stage is yours. So what... Your microphone, you have to put the microphone back on. Is it yep. good now? Can, can you all hear me? Yeah, thumbs up. All right, excellent. Um, I, I was saying thank you, Denis, for, for organizing this and for inviting me and for this uh, kind introduction. It's a, it's a real pleasure uh, to do this and to, um, 
to um, to do this in this uh, current situation. It's a, it's a difficult time for for all of us, I think, and and uh, it's, it's just a real pleasure to be able to to talk about science and and um, and and share some of our some of our recent uh, recent work. So I'm going to switch to um, to screen share. Um, and uh, switch to this keynote lecture. Uh, can you see that? Okay, no problem. All right. Thank you, Messi. All right, so um, I hope you can all uh, see this and um, I'm going to get started. So as Denis mentioned, um, today's presentation is, uh, is titled um, Human-Specific Genetic Modifiers of Cortical Connectivity and Circuit Function. Um, I'm going to uh, dive right in and, and, um, and tell you about um, the question that we've been interested in for, uh, for a very long time, um, uh, I would say over 15 years now, but uh, it became concrete um, for the past uh, 10 or 12 years. And this question uh, pertains to what makes us human, uh, because we're neuroscientists, um, we're mostly interested in, in uh, trying to improve our understanding of what makes our brain human specific. Um, and this question can be uh, rephrased in a slightly different way, which um, because we're, um, uh, we believe that, that to answer this question, we have to uh, find the genetic basis for human uniqueness. Um, this question can be rephrased by, by asking what happened in our genome since we diverged from our common ancestor um, um, over 7 million years ago now. Um, and in, 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 in other words, um, are there genetic modifiers of uh, brain development or brain function that we can identify and make sense? Um, so when, when talking about human specific features um, that needs to be specified um, and um, in order to, to make our brain unique, um, most of, of um, uh, research published um, so far has focused on um, uh, brain size increase, right? And, and this is um, a slide that depicts basically based on endocasts um, of the uh, hominid lineage, basically the fact that about 2 million years ago with the emergence of the homo lineage, uh, brain size has dramatically increased from by roughly threefold uh, from 500 cc to about 1500 cc. Um, we, we, one thing we should um, remind ourselves is that this increase in brain size is best correlated not only in the human lineage, but in all uh, animals, all mammals, to body size, right? And there's a very, very uh, almost linear correlation between um, um, body mass and, and brain mass. So that even um, uh, in, in Homo habilis, for example, that were only had a, you know, 500 cc brain, um, this um, brain was basically almost at scale um, with, uh, with, with current um, homo sapiens, modern humans. Um, so this brain size increase is very significant, but it, it, it's largely explained by, um, by um, total uh, brain size. And this is, uh, this is not simply um, uh, true for the hominid lineage. In fact, it's true for um, all mammals, right? That, um, 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 brain size has increased um, uh, very significantly in multiple lineages among different uh, uh, in, in different mammals, and so if what makes us um, uh, human specific um, in, in must have involved um, brain size increase, uh, it cannot be the only explanation. Many other things must have happened since um, the increase in cognitive abilities that characterize the human lineage. Um, are still pretty unique, right? And so we would like to argue that um, brain size and, and in particular the expansion of neocortex size relative to the rest of the brain um, must have been an important evolutionary step, but it cannot be the only step, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So what could be the other things that have emerged that um, during um, uh, human evolution that might underlie some of our unique cognitive abilities? Um, of course, many people over the years have speculated on this um, neural composition. There might be some novel cell types, such as um, phonogonomous cells, for example, 
uh, that have been, uh, that might have emerged and 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 underlie uh, specific uh, aspects of brain function. Uh, we focused um, um, a lot of our attention on neuronal connectivity because there's tangible and quantitative evidence suggesting that uh, human pyramidal neurons, at least in, in the neocortex, uh, are outliers uh, regarding the total number of connections they, they, they receive and, and form. Um, other um, things like the, the type of synapses, synaptic function might have changed um, uh, slightly. And so the real question became, um, how do we how do we study this right um, uh, how can we um, um, identify human specific genetic modifiers of any of those aspects or including aspects of brain development and brain function that we actually don't know about but are human specific right so uh, this this picture is just to illustrate the fact that um, neuronal connectivity is immensely and amazingly complex um, this is the work of a recent graduate student um, Dan Yaskona in the lab who had developed um, um, uh, uh, imaging techniques to map um, all synapses received all excitatory and all inhibitory synapses genetically labeled uh, received by single pyramidal neurons in layer two three of the mouse and um, I, I, I probably don't have to, to mention this, but in those neurons, excitatory synapses are received mostly over 90% um, onto dendritic spines, those little protrusions that, that come off the, the dendrite shaft. So most excitatory synapses are made onto those specialized dendritic protrusions called dendritic spines, and the inhibitory synapses are made uh, throughout the shaft of, of those dendrites. Um, but some, some of them are actually also found on spines, about 20% of inhibitory spines are also made on spines, um, forming what so-called duly innervated spines. So I, I, I won't have uh, you know, time to, to develop on this, but as you know, synapses, um, chemical synapses are, are the, the, the crux of, of neurotransmission in, in, in the brain. And there's a large body of, of, of work that's been done over the past uh, two or three decades, identifying different proteins that control um, uh, neurotransmission, synapse-specific properties, um, synapse-specific aspect of dendritic, uh, synaptic plasticity, for example. And um, in this particular neuron, just to illustrate my point, that, that connectivity that needs to be specified uh, is amazingly complex. This technique that we, that we recently published um, allowed us to really quantify the total number of excitatory inhibitory synapses made onto those neurons. And so in this particular neuron that I was showing, uh, receives at least 8,000 uh, excitatory synapses and about 1,000 uh, inhibitory synapses. So uh, talking about synapses, synapses, as I briefly mentioned, um, is something that has been quantified uh, very thoroughly by many labs um, in comparative neuroanatomy uh, um, uh, studies by uh, people like Javier Di Felipe, Rafa Yusti. And um, when, compared, when comparing pyramidal neurons from layer 2, 3 or layer 5, uh, between human, mouse, or uh, human and, and different non-human primates, it's pretty clear that just in terms of um, spine density, uh, by extrapolation, the total number of synapses is, um, is much higher in humans, about 40%, depending on, on um, the, the, um, the different dendritic domains. Those spines also have um, uh, distinct morphological features, like um, elongated spine necks and, and, and many other features. But the bottom line is that it's very well established that human uh, pyramidal neurons, cortical pyramidal neurons, are outliers with regard to non-human primates or other mammals in terms of the total number of synapses they, they, uh, they receive. And this is, interestingly, um, more work by Javier Di Felipe using zero em reconstruction shows that this increase in, uh, in synaptic density has, in excitatory synapse density, at least with regard to spines, has not been achieved at the expense of changing the uh, ratio between inhibition and excitation. So if you ratio the, the, the fraction of, of inhibitory versus excitatory synapses, um, there's a remarkable degree of conservation in uh, pyramidal neurons in different layers comparing human to um, other rodents or uh, other non-human primates. So, um, so increase in total connectivity in, in the total number of synapses, both excitatory and inhibitory, um, without any change in, um, and uh, with remarkable conservation of uh, excitatory inhibitory balance. So how do we study this question? And, and about um, uh, 10, uh, 12 years ago, 
my lab decided to um, study uh, um, human specific gene duplication. This was largely uh, the result of uh, the work of several labs, including Jim Sikela's lab um, uh, in Colorado or Evan Eichler's lab at UW, uh, who identified um, uh, human specific gene duplications. So large segmental duplications um, uh, that are um, unique to the uh, human genome that are not found in any other non-human primates. Uh, or any other mammals, for that matter, um, and so this is um, this is a very, this was a very interesting finding that about a, a, a significant number of genes, um, about 30, 35 gene families, had human-specific copies, basically, right? And so the question became, um, uh, can can we make sense out of this, right? And we were very interested in in, in this data, both from Jim Sikela and from Evan Eichler, because um, despite the fact that most of those genes have largely unknown functions, even to this day, um, there was a gene in that least SR gap two that caught our interest because we were probably the only lab that was working on the function of the ancestral copy of this gene that's shared among all mammals, and so we were very intrigued by the fact that this gene had human specific copies, basically. And so we, uh, we came up with a paradigm to, to ask several questions in, in this. Um, which of those genes are expressed in the human brain? I'm going to tell you about this uh, in a second. What is the function of the ancestral copy of those genes, right? And, and uh, as I said, many of those genes have completely unknown function during brain development. Um, and finally, the question that's a bit more challenging is, what is the function of the human-specific paralogs of those genes? Is the, the, the human-specific um, gene duplication, the, the copy, um, th does it have a function related to the, to the function and act as a modifier of the ancestral copy? Or have those genes uh, been truly neo-functionalized and maybe some of those genes might have acquired functions independent of the function of the ancestral copy? Okay, so more work has been done since then, since these original publications um, by several labs, including uh, uh, Megan Dennis, um, who now has an own lab, in, and uh, Evan Eichler, attempting to date the emergence of those, um, of those human-specific gene duplications. And to make a long story short, in particular for the two genes that we're interested in, um, SRGAP2B and SRGAP2A, um, those genes have emerged, um, those uh, copies basically that emerged from the ancestral copy called SRGAP2A have emerged roughly about um, uh, 2.4 to, to over 3 million years ago. And um, this is interesting uh, with regard to the emergence of the homo lineage since it, it's basically, at least for 2C, it, it corresponds exactly to um, the, the um, just prior to the emergence of the homo lineage before this massive um, uh, increase in brain size and, and, and complexity. So um, something I, I, I forgot to mention, but uh, when we started this project, one of the big challenges we had was to actually map the expression pattern of, of those um, gene duplications. Um, for a simple reason, which is that because they've emerged relatively recently during evolution, the human-specific paralogs of those um, at the base pair level are amazingly still well conserved uh, compared to the ancestral copy, so that um, the degree of conservation is, is over 99.8%, um, even in, in non-coding regions. Um, so making the uh, disambiguation between and being able to distinguish between uh, the human specific copy of those genes and the ancestral copy very challenging. This has been solved largely with the emergence of, um, uh, of deep sequencing techniques and uh, single RNA-seq. And in particular, the, the lab of uh, Pierre van der Hagen, uh, one of my colleagues and collaborator at, at the University of um, uh, Leuven, um, has uh, published recently a, a global survey um, of the expression pattern of uh, the ancestral copy and all the um, uh, human-specific gene duplications in this list. And, and to make a long story short, um, since this is published, um, these genes uh, fall in two categories, basically. Some genes are expressed mostly in dividing progenitors and uh, therefore might play a role in, in um, cortical expansion and expansion or control of proliferation of um, uh, uh, radial glial cells or, or intermediate progenitors. And then there's a second class of genes that we've been mostly, mostly interested in um, that are expressed in post-mitotic uh, neurons, um, at least in the cortical plate at um, early uh, embryonic development. Um, and later on, the, the, these genes, including SRGAP2B and SRGAP2C, uh, their expression is actually maintained throughout the life of the animal. For many of those genes, 
um, the expression is, um, is present in, even in the adult brain. This is illustrated here on a, on a different uh, representation. This is um, uh, taken from the lab of um, the work of uh, Arnold Quickstein at UCSF uh, that has um, uh, published and, and released publicly um, a very large body of, um, of, of work uh, based on single RNA seq, in fact, nuclear sequencing uh, in 120,000 um, uh, cortical, adult cortical neurons. Um, and um, each of these little clouds that you see here. Um, is basically the, the, the expression pattern of um, the, the genes, the ancestral copy in red here, and some of the uh, human-specific copies of those genes uh, in black here. And, and what you can, uh, you're not supposed to see the details, but essentially uh, many of the genes, but not all clearly, about 50% are maintained uh, throughout the adult, adulthood. And interestingly, uh, what I find most interesting is the fact that uh, those genes are actually mostly expressed in neurons. Um, very few of those genes are expressed at significant level in, in non-neuronal cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, or microglia, uh, with the exception of, um, uh, and, and, uh, of SRGAP2A. So, so SRGAP2A, uh, the ancestral copy, B and C, the two copies, are largely co-expressed um, in the same cells. Uh, pyramidal neurons in this cloud here, um, both layer 2, 3, layer 5, and layer 4, um, it did various uh, populations of interneurons, and but but not much in in, um, in non-neuronal uh, populations, astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, with the notable exception, SRGAP2 is the only gene, as far as we can tell, that's significantly expressed in microglial cells. Also, something we can uh, come back to later on uh, during the um, the discussion, if you want. But so the take-home message is that we now have um, uh, deep knowledge about where the ancestral copy of these genes are expressed in human neurons and uh, where and when the human-specific paralogs of those genes are expressed. And so for SRGAP2, again, uh, those genes are co largely co-expressed, the, the human-specific paralogs and the ancestral copy, and mostly in, in neurons. Uh, so what have we learned about um, um, SRGAP2 function over the years? Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, go relatively quickly on, on this since this is largely published and I mostly want to talk about unpublished data. But this is an important summary of what we've learned over the past uh, 10 years about what the ancestral copy of this gene does. So um, SRGAP2 encodes for um, a, a, a protein, a cytoplasmic protein containing three functional domains an F-bar domain, which is um, um, essentially a homodimerization motif and, and has uh, interesting properties in membrane deformation, a central RAC gap domain that's um, um, uh, an inhibitor of the small GTPs RAC1, and an SH3 domain, which is a protein-protein interaction. So what we've learned uh, over the years is that um, in the ancestral copy of this gene, SRGAP2A, in mouse neurons at least, <clears throat> has two main functions at synapses. One, it, um, it promotes the maturation of synapses, of both excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Uh, I'll show you that uh, more in a second. By, um, by essentially promoting both AMPA receptor accumulation at excitatory synapses and uh, GABA-A receptors at inhibitory synapses. So SRGAP2 promotes and speeds up the rate of synaptic maturation. The second function is that it seems to put a break on, um, on, on the density of both excitatory and inhibitory synapses that those neurons can form. So it limits the total number of synapses that both excitatory and inhibitory synapses that those neurons can make, and it promotes their maturation. So what we discovered over the years is that the truncated uh, version, uh, the, the human-specific paralogs, both SRGAP2B and SRGAP2C, I'm mostly going to tell you about uh, C because we, we think that both paralogs do exactly the same thing. Um, SRGAP2C expresses for a truncated version of, of the protein, just expressing this truncated f bar domain that can bind to and inhibits the function of SRGAP2A. Okay? So essentially, what you get uh, by humanizing for 2C expression, everything we've, we've found so far, is that you, you fin a copy, a partial loss of function of SRGAP2A. Um, that we that we uh, um, explored basically by knocking out the gene or, or knocking down uh, the gene. So humanization of 2C expression in mouse neurons largely phenocopies partial loss of function. And, and what happens essentially <coughs> in this condition is delayed excitatory and inhibitory synaptic maturation, increased density of both excitatory and in, in, inhibitory synapses by about 40%, but remarkably similar effect on both types of synapses. 
And interesting uh, changes also in the morphology of those uh, synapses. So, for example, dendritic spines have longer neck, um, and there's an interesting change in inhibitory synapse localization. There's an increase in the fraction of inhibitory synapses made onto dendritic spines. So I think this was interesting in the sense that just implementing and humanizing for this single gene uh, duplication seems to thin a copy many aspects of um, synaptic development that we know characterize um, human neurons, right? So this was really, really encouraging uh, and, uh, in, in this first, uh, um, really encouraging to see and, and really striking, I think, uh, to see that just this single gene seems to play an essential role um, in um, um, in, in humanizing some aspect of synaptic development in, in those neurons. So the work I'm, I'm going to tell you most about today, uh, following this introduction, uh, revolves around several in, in important questions that, that um, were, was, uh, were, were raised after we published these first papers. Um, the first question tackled by Ewald Schmidt, a very talented postdoc in my lab, was uh, where is this increased connectivity coming from? So we're saying that there's about a 40% increase in both excitatory and inhibitory connections. Where is this increased connectivity coming from? And second, what is the functional consequence of humanizing for um, those pyramidal neurons for SRIA 2 c uh, And what I'm going to tell you is that um, we think that this, um, this increase in synaptic density um, and, and, and in particular, this increase in cortical cortical connectivity that stems from 2C humanization uh, improves the reliability of sensory coding. And finally, um, if I have time I'm, and towards the end, I'm, I'll tell you some, some more preliminary uh, results um, that another very talented postdoc in my lab, Heike Blokius, has obtained, uh, putting SRGAP2 in a larger context um, by discovering that, in fact, SRGAP2 um, is a modifier of the a novel function for the roboreceptor, which is uh, best characterized as an axon guidance receptor. But robo is actually um, a novel uh, synaptogenic cue, basically, that promotes the formation of, um, of, um, of excitatory synapses in a synaptic-specific way. Um, and and SRGAP2A seems to um, to antagonize this function, basically. This is probably how it limits the... The, the number of excitatory synapses uh, that those pyramidal neurons can form. Okay, so let me um, um, dive down into, into the, the, the main results, basically, and this is still uh, a reminder of what we, what we published. I think I'm going to skip this because this is all published, and I'm, I'm just going to focus on, on, on this. If you had to remember anything from the previously uh, uh, published work is that we've accumulated a lot of evidence uh, based on uh, electrophysiology, uh, synaptic tagging, uh, synaptic mapping, that essentially um, SRGAP2C, humanization for SRGAP2C expression of those mouse uh, layer 2, 3 parameter neurons, uh, phenocopies every aspect of, of um, SRGAP2A loss of function. And that remarkably, it increases uh, the density of both excitatory and inhibitory synapses to remarkable um, to, to remarkably similar levels, basically. So we really um, uh, suspect that there's no change in, uh, in EI balance in those neurons, but there's a, a global increase, about 40, 50% uh, more um, ex both excitatory and inhibitory synapses received by those layer 2, 3 parameter neurons. And this is just to, to finish the summary of, of, of all the molecular work that uh, Cecilia in particular did in my lab uh, using gene replacement strategies where we can um, uh, uh, interfere with the function of the protein. Uh, we know that um, SRGAP2A promotes um, uh, excitatory synaptic maturation uh, through its ability to bind uh, to the uh, scaffolding protein HOMO1. It promotes the maturation of inhibitory synapses by binding to um, uh, the protein, uh, the scaffolding protein gephrin that scaffolds uh, GABA A receptors and inhibitory synapses. And finally, we could also show that we can dissociate this synaptic maturation effect um, uh, from the limitation of, um, of synaptic density uh, by point mutating in uh, the central uh, RAC gap domain. So this uh, gap domain that inhibits the small GTPAs RAC1 is, is the domain that's required um, through RAC inhibition to limit excitatory inhibitory synapse density. And so we could actually dissociate the synaptic maturation effect from the uh, limitation of uh, synaptic density in this context, um, at least at the molecular level. So let's dive down into uh, Eval's results that, that pertain to um, the, uh, exploring where this increased connectivity com is coming from. And in order to tackle this, 
um, Evout um, decided to uh, use a, um, a technique that was, um, that was um, uh, put forward by uh, Ed Calloway, um, monosynaptic rabies tracing, that allows um, the, 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 uh, to trace basically the neurons that are presynaptic to, um, to a given parameter neurons in this case. And so um, you could imagine two scenarios to explain this increased um, connectivity received by these humanized uh, neurons for sargap 2 c First model, um, the increased connectivity comes uh, from, originates from the same number of presynaptic neurons to, to these pyramidal neurons, uh, but each of those pyramidal neurons can form more connections. And or second, um, you could imagine that um, this increased connectivity comes from an actual increase in the number of presynaptic neurons forming connections, but each of those neurons form the same number of connections as, as um, in wild type neurons, right? So uh, in order to distinguish between those two scenarios, um, Evald um, um, modified the rabies, um, rabies, uh, monosynaptic rabies tracing technique. I won't go into the details, but he, he does that by um, uh, sparsely electrocorating uh, layer two through parameter neurons um, uh, with, a, with a construct that expresses all the, the necessary components for, um, for, to make those cells infectable with the rabies uh, virus. Um, and this, this plasmid is, is Cree dependent for its expression. So by using very low level of uh, Cree co-electrocoration, we can control the titer um, of, um, of the number of, of uh, potential starter cells, right? So, so this construct basically contains all the elements, including uh, the TVA receptor that makes these neurons infectable by rabies, and the glycoprotein that allows the, the virus to, um, to, upon infection of these neurons, to jump uh, one synapse away. And so um, he does this in utero electroporation to very sparsely um, uh, 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 create potential starter cells in, in layer 2, 3 um, of, uh, of the cortex. And then uh, in adult, basically, he injects um, rabies and tracing. Uh, we use the, the N2C pseudotype that, um, that Attila Dozanski, my colleague at, at, um, at Columbia and Tom Jessel, generated. That's much less cytotoxic than the original uh, SADB19 pseudotype. Um, and allowing to basically infect those cells, and then the rabies virus uh, expressing TD tomato jumps one synapse away and only one synapse away in the monosynaptically connected cells. <clears throat> On top of this, we did this um, in, uh, in a context of, um, we generated a uh, ROSA26 knock-in line uh, to humanize SRGAP2C in a Cree-dependent manner. And so um, in this context, basically, um, this, uh, this knock-in allows um, SRGAP2C expression uh, only in neurons that co-express uh, co Cree. So basically, in essence, the Cree electroporation that we do here not only turns on and makes those cells traceable, but cell autonomously induces SRGAP2C expression, okay? Uh, or not, I mean, if, the, if this is done in, in wild-type animals. So in, in all the results I'm going to show you today, results from um, uh, the humanization of 2C expression uh, and in, in a cell autonomous way, basically, and ask, uh, uh, can we see quantitative changes in, in um, the, the monosynaptically connected cells to those uh, between wild type or 2C expression, expressing cells? This technique, at least in, in Evald's hands, works uh, remarkably well, um, uh, especially when we control uh, very tightly the number of starter cells. So the starter cells are um, labeled here because they co-express um, nuclear GFP. And all the cells in magenta here um, are um, cells expressing uh, only the rabies um, uh, virus, so the cells that are monosynaptically connected to the cell. Evald uh, selected animals. He did uh, hundreds of uh, injections in, in uh, hundreds of animals, but in the end, we selected uh, only animals that had uh, very few starter cells, down to sometimes single starter cells. Um, uh, and, and the starter cells had to be in the central representation, the barrel representation of, um, of S1. So the first thing that, that we did since this was the first time we used this transgenic uh, way to, um, to humanize for 2C expression uh, was to check basically um, if uh, this, this way of humanizing for 2C expression led to a change in uh, synaptic density that was compatible with the previously published results from our lab. And, um, and for, for, uh, to do this, uh, he did this uh, between wild type animals and transgenically uh, humanized for 2C uh, in layer two, three pyramidal neurons in, in, in the barrel cortex and looked at spine density basically in uh, the apical tuft, the apical oblique or the basal um, dendrites of those cells. And what we found remarkably is that 
um, the 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 increase in spine density that we reported before is present both in, in apical dendrites, both in apical oblique and the apical tuft, but is not detected in the basal dendrites here. So it really suggested for the first time that in fact 2C uh, expression uh, act as a modifier uh, of connectivity, but it seems to do so in a synapse specific way, at least in a domain specific way. And I'll come back to this because we think that this is compatible with what I'm going to tell you in a second, that uh, 2C promotes uh, specifically the, the, the formation of cortical-cortical connections um, and that this, this localized increase in spine density represents um, a, um, um, a domain-specific increase in, in these cortical-cortical connections. I'm going to skip this, but just to advertise the fact that um, uh, Eval also had to develop computational ways to actually uh, register all the trace cells uh, in 3D in each brain in multiple animals using, um, using uh, uh, a common reference atlas. We, we picked the Alan Brain reference atlas. Um, and so uh, to make a long story short, when we trace the, the inputs to those layer 2, 3 parameter neurons in a very quantitative way, um, we, uh, we discovered that um, there's no change in the 2C animals, in, in the animals where um, we humanize for 2C expression, we don't see an, a, a change in, in the origin of those uh, connections. So there, there's no new connectivity uh, emerging uh, with regard to topology, right, and topography of these connections. But there's a, there's a very uh, interesting change in a quantitative change in the um, in, in the number of um, connections made. So uh, everything I'm, I'm going to show you in the next few slides uh, relies on uh, computing in, an index of connectivity, which is basically the ratio of the total number of trace cells divided by the number of starter cells, right? So this, in order to normalize basically this connectivity per um, uh, starter cell, right? And what you can immediately see on this plot is that um, there's a significant increase um, in um, uh, inputs coming from um, local inputs from S1 itself, right? So the local cloud, basically, of uh, mostly feed-forward connections um, in, in S1 itself. Um, there's an increase in uh, connectivity coming from S2, the, um, the secondary somatosensory cortex, uh, from M2, which is one of the main inputs from the feedback, uh, long-range feedback connections, and e even from control lateral S1. Interestingly, we don't see a change in, um, in connectivity originating from the thalamus. Those layer two, three parameter neurons are known to receive monosynaptic inputs from secondary uh, um, thalamic nuclei, such as VP, PO, and, and uh, VA. Um, and there's absolutely no change in this connection. So it seems that this increased connectivity um, uh, arising from humanizing for 2C expression mostly originates from um, cortical, uh, short and long range cortical cortical connections. This is detailed a, a little bit more in the next few slides. Um, the long-range feedback connections originating from M2 is increased very significantly, uh, both uh, when we divide it up uh, between layer 2-3 uh, or layer 5-6. Same thing for control lateral um, uh, connections coming from uh, control lateral S1. Um, in, uh, in ipsilateral S1, so this cloud of uh, neurons, uh, which constitute the, the bulk of connectivity, uh, close to 90% of the connections, monosynaptic connections received by those layer 2-3 uh, parameter neurons originate from local uh, connections. Uh, this is increased um, also very significantly, mostly uh, from layer 4 and layer 5-6, um, so so-called so feed-forward uh, excitation. Okay, so Again, um, inter very interesting and specific increase in, in um, short and long-range uh, cortical-cortical connectivity. In order to, to interpret these local connections, we had a problem, which was that um, these local connections, um, of course, is, is made um, by a uh, mixture of both excitatory and inhibitory neurons, right? Um, we, we estimate, you know, roughly 90% of uh, excitation, 10% uh, inhibition, but uh, we couldn't, just based on this tracing, we couldn't differentiate between the two. And, um, and so what Ivar has done is, is go back to the sections and restain all the sections with markers of inhibitory neurons. We picked two very classical markers, somatostatin and PV, uh, because together uh, these two markers uh, labeling respectively Martin T cells and, and uh, large basket cells, five spiking large basket cells, those com combined, those two markers label about 80% of um, cortical interneurons. So, and interestingly, we don't see an increase in number of presynaptic interneurons to those um, humanized uh, neurons for 2C compared to wild type. 
um, um, but we see an, an increase, about a doubling in the number of uh, local uh, recurrent excitation um, in, in, this, uh, in, this, in, 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 in these two sea animals. So to, to summarize basically this first part, uh, what I've uh, shown you are preliminary results um, suggesting that um, these cells are, um, this, when we humanize for SRGAP 2C expression, we select, at least in layer 2, 3 parameter neurons, we selectively increase uh, both feed forward excitation and long range feedback um, excitation in those neurons. But we don't change, for example, um, thalamic, um, in, in the number of thalamic inputs. Uh, um, excited inputs from, uh, from those cells. And so, so this really suggests that SRGAP2C um, is, a, is a synaptic modifier, basically increasing connectivity, but selectively increasing um, cortical, cortical connectivity uh, in those layer two, three parameter neurons. So one of the questions that we wanted to ask in this context was, what is the functional consequence of this increased cortical, cortical connectivity, right? And is, does this have a functional impact on the response properties of those uh, layer two, three parameter neurons? And um, Eval decided to use uh, in vivo two photon imaging um, to, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the barrel representation in order to, to test and, and measure the response properties of those neurons using a very simple paradigm to start with. I'm just going to show you this, this set of results, uh, which is um, a, a, a basically a, a very broad, um, uh, high-frequency um, whisker stimulation for periods of five seconds in those animals, interleaved with periods of 25 seconds um, um, with uh, no sensory stimulation. Those animals are head fixed. Uh, we use in vivo two photon imaging to, to look at the sensory evoked response properties of those layer two, three parameter neurons using a uh, Taiwan GCAM6. Um, and we repeat this uh, paradigm 24 times. So, so we have very large number of uh, sensory evoked responses in, in uh, animals that are wild type or um, humanized for 2C expression. So uh, when we do um, uh, clustering analysis and, and uh, we, we basically um, uh, categorize the type of response properties that we see, we see very classical, uh, classically three types of responses on responses, so responses that are phase locked to the onset of um, uh, whisker stimulation, um, so-called plateau responses, responses that are not phase locked to the onset, but uh, basically um, are staggered uh, during the, the, the the, the stimulation. And finally, we see off responses, the so responses that um, are, are, are phase locked to the offset to the, um, to the end of the, the, the stimulation. If you uh, basically uh, uh, look at the response properties, um, both in wild type and SRGAP 2 c they basically tile the entire um, uh, duration of the sensory stimulation, um, of the whisker stimulation in this. Interestingly enough, we do not see a change in the fraction of neurons that respond either in an on plateau or off way um, in the 2C animals compared to, to the wild type. So there's no change in, in the fraction of neurons that respond ever to any of those stimulations. But the, the most striking change that we see is that for the on responders, basically, we see a very significant uh, doubling in the fraction of response, so the, the response probability for the neurons that do respond in an on way. So those neurons become basically uh, more reliably, um, um, more reliable uh, coders basically, and respond um, at higher probability to uh, whisker stimulation. We see a, a slight but significant reduction in the fraction of neurons um, in, in the response probability uh, for the plateau responders and no change for the off response. Right. So this is a very interesting result because it suggests that um, uh, SRGAP2C expression probably through its ability to promote um, both short range and long range cortical cortical connectivity um, improves the, uh, sense, the reliability of sensory coding in this. We wondered if this if these neurons really receive more excitatory input. We we wondered if, if this was true even in the absence of sensory response. So remember that we used this um, twenty five second. Um, um, intervals between sensory uh, 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 stimulation. And so we looked at the activity, uh, the uh, uh, presumed spiking activity in, in those neurons uh, in the intertrial interval. And surprisingly, we see very drastic and significant reduction in both the amplitude and um, the, 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 the frequency of those transients. This is probably best illustrated on this. Those layer two, three uh, parameter neurons in wild type animals are very uh, sort of sparse coders and they're pretty unreliable uh, sensory coders, um, right? So they, they respond with some probability um, in, during sensory stimulation, but they spike also uh, during uh, in the 
um, uh, seemingly absence of sensory stimulation. In the 2C, uh, in, uh, in, in the layer 2, 3 parameter neurons uh, humanized for 2C, we see a reduction, uh, in fact, in the uh, activity in the intertrial, and we see an increased probability of response um, in the, um, during the, the sensory uh, stimulation. So it seems to us like there's a pretty significant change uh, in improvement in the signal to noise ratio um, um, and in this layer two, three parameter neurons, at, at least with regard to this simple um, uh, whisker sensory stimulation. So this is to summarize the, the first part of the talk. Um, we think that um, that um, there is a um, that that SR humanization for SR gap two C expression uh, increase um, selectively um, the the fraction of cortical cortical both, both uh, feed forward and feedback um, cortical cortical connections they receive um, at the expense of other um, connections and that um, we we. What we see is that in, in, in the context of uh, sensory evoked response, those neurons uh, become more uh, reliable in sensory coding um, with an, a marked improvement in signal to noise, basically, in, in their ability to respond selectively to the sensory stimulation. Okay, so um, in the, the next um, um, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to um, switch gear, basically, and tell you um, and try to put SRGAP2A and SRGAP2C function in a larger context and try to explain to you uh, some reasons we have to think that SRGAP2A is downstream of a novel synaptogenic function of robo um, in this context. And so um, this is the work of um, another very talented postdoc in lab, Heike Blokus, uh, who decided to join my lab um, towards the end of her um, PhD. Uh, she contacted us because um, she was studying robofunction in, in Alain Chedotard's lab in Paris uh, in the context of axon guidance. As you probably uh, know, uh, slit robo signaling has mostly been characterized in the context of axon guidance. Um, and there's very little known about the downstream signaling mechanisms for robo function during uh, axon guidance. And so she, she contacted me uh, towards the end of her um, PhD, asking me if she could uh, obtain some reagents for SRGAP2 to actually test this, if SRGAP2 was actually downstream of robo. This largely um, originated from the initial work um, of Yi Rao's group, um, who in 2001 cloned uh, the SRGAP um, uh, gene family um, uh, and, and showed that uh, this gene actually, uh, this protein uh, through its SH3 domain, binds to the intracellular domain of robo. And so they postulated that this gene might play a role in, um, in modulating and inhibiting, uh, antagonizing robo function in the context of cell migration or, or um, axon guidance. So far, I should tell you that we, we haven't been able to, 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 to show that SRGAP2, in particular, mediates any of the axon guidance function of robo. It's not entirely surprising retrospectively because we know now that SRGAP2, is, um, the protein itself, is, is um, um, almost not found in axons and it's mostly found in dendrites. Um, so it's suggested that SRGAP2 might be a modifier of robo function in dendrites rather than axons. Heike actually reproduced this interaction and could show that SRGAP2 does bind to uh, robo um, in, in, in this context, so we could reproduce the interaction. Because we, we knew that um, SRGAP2 played such a, an interesting role in uh, regulating synaptic development, we postulated that the dendritic function, there was an unknown dendritic function of robo in uh, controlling um, uh, synaptic uh, development. And um, to make a long story short, the, the main function that Heike uncovered is, a, um, is that robo plays a synaptogenic function controlling uh, input specific um, uh, synaptic specificity. And so we, we decided, um, Heike decided to study this in, in the hippocampus, which is uh, much easier in many ways to, to, to do than in the cortex, simply because in the hippocampus, um, those parameter neurons, especially in CA1, receive incredibly uh, well compartmentalized synaptic inputs. Uh, so for example, um, their basal dendrites receives inputs from CA2, CA3, uh, whereas the, uh, and the, their apical oblique also from CA3 very selectively, uh, but their, uh, only their distal um, um, uh, dendrites receive inputs from long range input from the anterior cortex. The degree of segregation of these inputs onto CA1 parameter neurons is absolutely remarkable. It's, you can draw a line, basically, um, there's absolutely no overlap, basically, between uh, these uh, this inputs. And so um, 
the, the other re two reasons uh, convinced us to, to look for a potential function in, of robo in, in dendrites and in synaptic specificity. The first one is that, um, uh, uh, as depicted in this um, uh, uh, review from Yoris David and Arabhan Ghosh, um, uh, slit, um, li the ligands, the extracellular ligands, slit contains uh, four arrays of leucine rich repeat domains, which have been uh, recently involved uh, in a large class of molecules called leucine rich repeat transmembrane protein. Um, as key uh, proteins mediating uh, synaptic specificity. So the ability of specific axons to recognize and form uh, specific uh, synapses on two specific dendritic domains of other neurons. So it, it seemed plausible, as depicted in, in this review, that SLIT might be involved in, in this SLIT robo signaling, uh, despite the fact that there was absolutely nothing known. This was pure speculation on, on Joris and, and Arnavan to put this in, in, uh, in this category, but it turned out to be, to be right. The second reason that, that uh, suggested that uh, robo-slit might play a role in synapse formation, independent of their axon guidance uh, f uh, function, was that their pattern of expression is, is strikingly maintained after axon guidance is over. So in the hippocampus, for example, uh, both robo-1 and robo-2, the main receptors in, in, in this uh, context, are expressed at P14, uh, which is the peak of synaptogenesis, but after axon guidance is, is over. And their expression is even maintained throughout the uh, adulthood in, in, in those structures. So really suggesting that they, they must play functions beyond axon guidance. Interestingly, as depicted here, uh, dorsal CA1 here uh, receives, um, uh, it expresses robo-2, but not robo-1. So it, it suggested that we, we had a limited genetic redundancy to deal with here. And the ligand for, uh, for this, uh, at least SLEED2, is expressed very specifically in CA3. Um, so it could actually be uh, presented, SLEED could be presented by the axons um, uh, of CA3 uh, onto CA1 parabola neurons. If you look at the protein expression, something remarkable uh, emerged, which is that um, robo-2 protein is remarkably compartmentalized in its expression in, in the dendrites of those C1 parameter neurons. So it's present in SO and SR, basically, but it's completely excluded from the uh, apical tuft of those C1 parameter neurons in SLM, where another re uh, trans transsynaptic receptor, FLIRT2, for example, is present. Um, so this remarkable degree of compartmentalization of the protein expression encouraged us to, to pursue a potential function, a dendritic function for robo in this context. So um, um, Heike actually confirmed that a robo-2 is present postsynaptically. We benefited from a, a, a construct of robo-fluorine, robo-2-fluorine construct uh, made by Valerie Castellani in Lyon um, to probe the, the, the the transmembrane um, uh, presented form of robo basically in, in dendrites of those cortical parameter neurons, and we could we could show that this um, um, that robo two uh, the transmembrane uh, presentation of robo two is, is present at excited tree synapses labeled here for example with uh, homo one c. Uh, in collaboration with um, Joris David, we also uh, did um, 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 uh, protein. Uh, fractionation, basically membrane fr fractionation from synaptosomes uh, that allows to purify pre- and postsynaptic membranes. And we could show that uh, we found that robo-2 is enriched um, um, postsynaptically and that SLEED2 is actually enriched presynaptically with uh, presynaptic membranes, which is very interesting since it's an extracellular protein, but it's a very large uh, extracellular protein. So it, it, it's, it seems to be uh, enriched presynaptically. So, okay, so the most the most important uh, question that we had to, to answer for this part and determine whether or not Robo2 uh, played a role in, in synapse formation based on its expression pattern was to provide loss of function uh, evidence. Um, in, and what Heike did was develop um, a, a really nice um, in utero electroporation technique, taking advantage of the flux allele uh, that was provided by Alain Chalotel for Robo2 um, and did in utero electroporation. Um, targeting very specifically dorsal CA1, uh, allowing us to allowing us to express TD tomato um, uh, in in a flex plasmid in a Cree-dependent way. Again, we played the trick of um, expressing uh, a very low amount of Cree, uh, controlling the sparsity of this um, of, of this uh, electroporation expression. And so this technique is 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 really exciting for us for two reasons. The first one is because you get um, you, up to, you essentially obtain um, optically isolated cells, um, but mostly because also it's it, this manipulation is not only a cell autonomous deletion of Robo2, where Cree uh, allows to not only turn on Tinea tomato but delete Robo2. So it's not only a cell autonomous deletion; 
in, in C1 parameter neurons, it's a postsynaptic autonomous manipulation. Since the vast majority, over you know, close to 100% of the axons uh, contacting those dendrites are wild type. Okay, um, and what Heike found pretty remarkably is that in these neurons, when we delete conditionally delete only those cells um, for Robo2, we see about a 40% decrease in um, in the uh, spine density in both uh, SO and SR, where CA2, CA3 afferents um, make synapses, but absolutely no effect in the apical tuft, uh, where the protein is not localized. So there's a beautiful match uh, between where the protein is localized and when we see, where we see uh, reduction um, in spine density. So this really suggested that uh, Robo2 is required to promote um, uh, the formation of about 40% of inputs um, coming from CA2, CA3, or in, in a domain-specific way, right, um, in this context. In collaboration with um, um, uh, um, Miki, a postdoc in Attila Lazanski's lab, our main collaborator at Columbia, uh, we did uh, uh, slice electrophysiology um, comparing um, uh, the uh, EPSP frequency in knockout cells in, uh, and the pair recordings in wild-type cells in, in the same slices, and we confirmed that essentially uh, there's no change in, in AMPA receptor mediated um, EPSP amplitude, but there's a drastic about 35% reduction in, in EPSP frequency in, in those cells, um, confirming that essentially those cells probably have you know 30 to 40% reduction in total number of um, uh, inputs um, from uh, excitatory inputs. I'm going to move quickly on, on, on this part. We wanted to, to, to demonstrate that Robo2 is actually a synaptogenic cue. And for this, we used the beautiful assay developed by Peter Scheifele uh, years ago now that allows to test if a molecule is, is um, sufficient to uh, induce synapse formation by mimicking, in this case, a dendritic um, expression for Robo2, um, expressing Robo2 in HEK cells and performing co-cultures and ask, ask basically if this um, uh, pro transmembrane protein expressed in, in these heterologous cells is sufficient to induce synapse formation from incoming excitatory or inhibitory axons. And um, I wouldn't tell you this if it wasn't the case. Um, our positive control is, is a well-known synaptogenic cue, neural ligand one, uh, which uh, can evoke the excitatory synapses, uh, labeled here by Viglut one. Both Robo one and Robo two um, are, um, are are very potent at inducing excitatory synapse formation. Uh, interestingly, Robo three, a closed ortholog that cannot bind to slit, um, and doesn't have this activity. Uh, and this is quantified here. Um, so both Robo1 and Robo2 um, can uh, induce excitatory synapse formation, but not Robo3. This was suggesting, based on, on P the PhD work of Heike, uh, that this synaptogenic activity of Robo1 or Robo2 uh, required slit binding. And so in order to do this, we tested this two different ways. One, by deleting the last two IG domains of Robo that are required for slit binding, uh, or in a more subtle way, uh, to do a point mutation in a leucine uh, um, uh, residue in the first IG domain that completely abrogates the ability of uh, robot to bind to sleep. And both of these uh, CDN express and HEK cells uh, are completely um, devoid of um, synaptogenic activity. So the synaptogenic activity of robot requires sleep binding. And interestingly, um, uh, unlike neuroligin 1 that can promote the formation of inhibitory synapses, um, uh, as well as excitatory synapses, robo doesn't have any effect on the inhibitory synapse um, uh, formation. So robo uh, promotes in a sleep dependent way the formation of excitatory synapses. I'm not going to show you all the details, but in collaboration with Joris David, we identified the presynaptic binding partner for this uh, novel transsynaptic complex, and it turns out to be neurexins, which are probably the best known uh, presynaptic uh, uh, organizing molecule that, that um, controls synaptic specificity um, by binding to, uh, to uh, different postsynaptic binding partners, um, and therefore allowing the emergence of synaptic specificity in this context. So um, lastly, uh, for the, 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 the last few slides I'm going to show you so far, just to summarize, I've showed you that we've identified, I've shown you some of the data, we have much more data than this. Um, suggesting the existence of a novel transsynaptic complex whereby robo slit um, uh, and neurexin can um, induce the formation of excitatory synapses and that this complex is required at least in, in C1 parameter neurons specifically for the formation of um, uh, inputs to the proximal dendrites but not the distal dendrites. 
So the, the real question, and that's the, the, the last thing I'll, I'll tell you, is um, could we actually um, take advantage of the hippocampus and hippocampus circuits in order to determine if this um, reduction in input specificity by about 40% uh, of those CA3 inputs onto CA1, does that lead to any functional changes in the response properties of those cells? As you probably uh, all know, based on the work from the Mosers and, and John O'Keefe, um, these dorsal C1 pyramidal cells are uh, often called uh, play cells because they can they encode and respond uh, very specifically to specific locations uh, during um, uh, an animal navigation. And so um, Heike developed this technique where we can actually um, image and taking advantage of a, a beautiful in vivo two photon imaging uh, approach that was developed by Attila, uh, where we can image the, the function, uh, the response properties using GCAMP of uh, large uh, numbers of C1 pyramidal cells um, in animals where in red here we have uh, Robo2 knockout cells and in green, um, in green only um, wild type cells. So in the same animals we can probe the response properties of Robo2 knockout cells, cells that are deafferented by about 40% for CA3, CA2 inputs and, and compare that in the same animals, uh, compare the response properties of those neurons uh, in, in wild type cells. These techniques uh, work remarkably well using in vivo two photon imaging and allows the probe um, to probe basically the response properties of large ensembles of cells in awake behaving animals as the animal traverses this uh, um, this um, this trade mill. And so um, this is really a, 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 an incredibly powerful uh, system since you know in in one animal in one training session you can map the response properties of you know. Uh, uh, five to eight hundred neurons at a time, um, and those neurons basically uh, form those uh, specific place field um, by responding very specifically to a given location on the belt here. It's about a two meters long belt. So this is a remarkably powerful approach because, again, in in one snapshot, you you, you can show you know you can probe the response properties of large ensemble of neurons. And so when we did this in um, comparing the Robo2 deficient um, C1 parameter neurons to control neurons in uh, in about eight animals, um, about. 20,000 uh, cell responses probed for control cells, about 3,000, about 10% uh, or so uh, robot deficient cells. Um, we saw re reduced spike frequency, confirming some of the slice physiology we did. Um, there's an increase in the fraction of silent cells, cells that are not responding uh, um, ever. Uh, to um, or at least not encoding, um, not having any spatial tuning properties. But most interestingly, we see a, a, about a 50% reduction in the fraction of cells that are spatially tuned. You can probably see this already on these uh, raster plots, basically. Um, there's about a 50% reduction in the, cell, in the fraction of cells that are spatially tuned. There are also some very interesting changes in the actual response properties of those place cells. Uh, they become paradoxically more specific in, in their response properties. Um, but the, the bulk of the result was that this um, genetically based um, deafferentation um, of um, CA3 inputs in those cells um, uh, 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 result in, in, in the reduction of about 50% of the cell that, that are spatially tuned. So um, for the last slide I'm going to uh, end here, I want to, the, take, the main take home message uh, of this is twofold. Uh, the first one is that um, on the SRGAP2 front, uh, we've basically uh, I've, I've provided you some evidence that humanization of SRGAP2 C expression leads to a synapse specific increase um, in cortical cortical connectivity in those, and that leads to um, an improvement uh, in uh, their sensory coding properties. In the second part, uh, Heike's work. Um, I've tried to show you that we identified a novel function for robo in synapse formation, excitatory synapse formation, and in particular that in C1 pyramidal neurons, robo promotes in a synapse specific way the formation of inputs from uh, CA3, CA2, but not the anterior cortex. We have preliminary results suggesting that SRGAP2A antagonizes this function, so um, essentially puts a break on the synaptogenic activity of robo. And our current mo working model is that um, humanization of 2C by um, a downregulating 2A function releases this break, basically, and promoting the synaptogenic activity of robo. And so the future of this, this work collectively would be to actually cross foster the two stories and, and test uh, the possibility that SRGAP2C is a human-specific modifier of the robot um, synaptogenic activity and that this is how it controls and promotes uh, 
uh, the formation of cortical cortical connections in those layer two three pyramidal neurons. This would be, uh, I, I think, a really uh, encouraging result. Uh, in collaboration with Pierre van Ergen as a future direction, we're also testing the reverse uh, question um, and uh, taking advantage of their um, uh, beautiful system where they can do xenograft of human uh, ES cell derived para cortical pyramidal neurons grafted in, 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 in mouse cortex. Uh, those neurons form beautiful pyramidal neurons, they form spines. Very recently, Pierre's uh, lab has shown that, in fact, those neurons um, uh, are characterized by a very neotenic um, um, uh, aspect of synaptic development. So it takes months for those neurons to form spines. But ultimately, they, they do mature. Um, and uh, you can even record uh, very interesting um, uh, response properties, for example, in the visual cortex, those neurons adopt uh, orientation selectivity. And, and we think that this, uh, this uh, grafting model is a beautiful way to now start asking questions. What happens if we knock out those human-specific genes in those human pyramidal neurons? And we have some, I think, tantalizing uh, preliminary results um, uh, with, uh, with Pierre uh, uh, Baptiste in his lab, suggesting that, in fact, if you knock down this um, SRGAP2 base to see in human neurons, you uh, speed up very significantly uh, the rate of synaptic maturation in those neurons. So um, stay tuned. There's a lot more coming on, on this front, trying to, to test a reverse question of testing the function of the, uh, instead of humanize, humanizing mouse neurons, testing the function of these human-specific uh, gene duplications in, in human neurons. All right, so I'm, I'm going to end here and, and, and uh, uh, have two th uh, thank you slides. The first, for the first part, um, Ivald Schmidt um, uh, was uh, greatly helped uh, uh, by multiple members of the lab, but, but also, uh, in particular, this was a collaboration with um, uh, Teresa Sell, a postdoc in Elizabeth Hinland's lab at, uh, in, in our uh, institute at the Zuckerman Institute. Uh, Teresa was instrumental in helping uh, Ivald with uh, multiple levels of his two-photon analysis. I want to thank um, some of the funding agencies that have supported this work over uh, the past decade or so, um, NINDS, the NIH, uh, two foundations, the, the Spolberg uh, Foundation and recently the Nomis Foundation, uh, who both have um, um, uh, provided us with some key resources to, to pursue this work. And the second part um, that was done by Heiko Blukus in the lab uh, was um, uh, benefited tremendously from multiple uh, investigators, uh, our collaborator at Sila Lazanski uh, for all the in vivo imaging, uh, uh, hippocampal imaging, Larry Shepard for some of the biophysical work I, I didn't have time to show you, and uh, greatly benefited also from Joris David, um, 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 our collaborator in, in Leuven uh, for some, of, uh, some aspect of this work. So I want to... Thank you all for your attention and be happy to, to take questions. All right, clapping for, for everyone. Um, Frank, I'm gonna call you. So you can participate further. All right, so I, I, I still don't have any sound, so uh, yeah. here we go. Hello? Timothy, you hear me? Yes, I can yeah. hear you. Yeah, so everybody was clapping very loud. Uh, um, <laughs> thank you very much. Super for nice. A, thank you so much. Great, thanks for a great talk uh, and for, for sharing all these unpublished data. You really brought us from uh, from one corner of the of the brain to the other, from one species to another, and it's a very inspiring set of experiments. Um, so, so the way this is going to work now, thank I you think. Very much. I think given that we have uh, this audio problem, um, it makes sense that you would go through the question. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you see this um, little thing there that says ask, ask, question. ask a question. Yep. And if you click on it, then you have a list of questions. So I, I suggest um, you read them out loud because not necessarily everyone sees them and, and give them an answer if you if you can or if you feel like it. Absolutely, yeah, 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 definitely. I think it's a great system, and and it seems that people even vote for uh, for those. So they're, they're even ranked like by by number. So um, by by interest. Starting, and yeah. if if something happens, I'll just wave or call you. So sounds great. Sounds great. All right. So the first question is: Are there similar genetic effects at work in other evolutionary jumps? Say, if you would compare mouse and monkey, or all, all versus new world monkey? That's an excellent question. Um, in fact, 
Absolutely. So it turns out that um, there, there are not only human specific uh, gene duplication events, there are uh, human specific, uh, there, there are genes, uh, sorry, there are uh, uh, gene duplications that are specific to every lineage. You know, uh, gene duplication is a major driver of evolution and speciation. Uh, and so um, th th there, there are definitely large segments of duplications that are specific to all primates, right? So, so those are, are gene duplications that are uh, common to, to humans and uh, non-human primates. Um, and and th there are definitely gene duplications that are specific to each of those lineages. So those are also super interesting um, uh, gene duplication to, to look at, right? And um, gene duplication is, of course, one driving force uh, in this system. There are many other um, aspects of genomic evolution at play, right? Including, um, uh, you know, uh, single base pair uh, polymorphisms, right? That are that are lineage specific uh, in human so-called human accelerated regions, um, and so yes, so so it would be it would be amazing to basically broaden this scope and and test the function of this, um, of, of for example, primate specific, um, right? I mean, uh, gene duplications. We haven't done so. Uh, this is really an emerging field. There are many labs that are um, that are uh, starting to, to ask those questions, and I'm sure. Um, in the next few years, we're going to see an explosion of, uh, of work on this. The, the second question was, um, was wondering if, if there's any temporal variation in the level of 2C protein in adult neurons, and if so, um, if, if this would be involved in plasticity of synapses. Yes. Um, we, uh, we, we don't really uh, know if there's changes in, in uh, the relative level of expression of 2C and 2A at the protein level, it's been very difficult to probe, but it seems that uh, throughout adulthood, uh, there is definitely a constant co-expression of both 2A and 2C. So it seems that, and, and this is uh, for a simple reason, at least at the mRNA level, at the transcript level, um, gene regulation is, is basically essentially the same between 2A and, and 2C, 2B and 2C. Because the, the, the segment, the duplication um, actually uh, include a large uh, portion of the regulatory sequences of those genes. Uh, and so they're, they're very likely to be under the same uh, regulatory, um, uh, um, uh, trans at least transcriptional control. Um, but, but the second part of the question is if, if there is any involvement in synaptic plasticity. So yes, because those proteins uh, are expressed throughout uh, as far as you can tell, in cortical pyramidal neurons throughout uh, the life of the animal, including some of the data I showed you in, in adult uh, cortical neurons, uh, we we have some reasons, some preliminaries are suggesting that this that SR gap two also controls um, some aspect of structural plasticity, and so stay tuned. There, there's there's more to come for this too. Uh, it's possible that that uh, SR gap two C participates to some aspect of um, of humanization of synaptic plasticity rules, uh, something we're very excited about. <clears throat> the third question is, um, do the humanized SRGAP2C show any change in behavior, perhaps related to improved uh, responses? So I didn't want to show you this, but we, we have some, um, some, some really exciting new uh, results uh, about this. Eve out in my lab uh, in collaboration with Randy Bruno, one of our uh, collaborator in the institute, and um, and uh, Jung Park, um, a, a postdoc in Randy's lab, have adapted a, um, a sensory discrimination task. So the problem in, in testing behavioral performance in, in those two sea animals, right, if you think about it, is that um, it, 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 it's, it's, you, you have to come up with a behavioral task that, that you can uh, make it very difficult for the wild type animals if, if you're hoping to see an improvement in behavioral performance uh, compared to, 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 to the wild type in the 2C animals, right? And this is not easy. So most behavioral tests that, that, that people use you know, to probe um, different aspects of uh, sensor integration or, or, or cognition are actually you know, relatively easy even for wild type mice. They've been tuned to, 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 to be feasible by wild type mice. So, so we decided to come up with a, a test that's based on sensory, uh, somatosensory whisker di discrimination where the animal has to um, associate uh, different textures uh, that they can probe with their whiskers to a uh, left or right uh, leaking, uh, left or right leaking task. Uh, 
And we can make this task very difficult for the wild type animals. Um, and, um, and, and what we see is that there's a very significant improvement in behavioral performance in the 2C animals. So it's very exciting. It suggests that this sensory discrimination, this improvement in sensory coding might translate to uh, improve sensory discrimination, at least in this task. Uh, what's really striking is that uh, the, the task is so difficult for the wild type animals that even after 50 training sessions, um, so this is a very long experiment that Ibald did with Jung, uh, even after 50 uh, uh, training sessions, about 40% of the wild type animals have still not learned the task. So they, uh, we, we, we qualify for learning um, uh, as, as by, by saying that the animals have to perform at 70% um, uh, accuracy for two sessions in a row. So by that criteria, about 40% of the wild type mice never learn the task, and only 10% of the, the, um, the two sea animals uh, don't learn it, so 90% learn it. So, so we're very excited. It seems to be an improving performance, and in the fraction of animals, there's about a uh, you know, threefold with, uh, improvement in, in fraction of, of uh, animals that learn the task. So we're very excited by this. The other question was, have you assessed whether inputs from CG-derived interneurons is increased? I'm not mistaken, presumably evolutionary more novel. No, we, we haven't looked at this. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, we, we've, we've only looked at, uh, PV and SST in this context. It would be interesting to do a more thorough uh, survey of, of um, synaptic inhibitory synapse distribution also on those uh, layer two, three parameter neurons. We haven't done that. Uh, we, we also, something we need to do is that uh, the, this gene is expressed in interneurons too. Uh, we don't know what it does, you know, both 2A and 2C. We don't know what it does there, but if, if it plays the same, similar function than in, than in pyramidal neurons, uh, it would be very interesting to, to look at their function in, um, in, in those neurons. From uh, Tudor, there's a question about, um, two big picture questions. How do we jump from the quantitative synapse density increase to the qualitative differences? in humans versus animal species. Not sure I, I, I fully understand this, but, but, but I, I'll, I'll, I think I, I get the question. It's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question, right? I mean, you know, everything we've done over the past, um, the past 12 years revolves around making links between changes we see in uh, synapse, synaptic development, right? Either a quantitative number of inputs uh, or, or changes in, in the rate of maturation of those inputs. And, and make links between these changes and cortical circuit function. It's a big jump, right? So what I've tried to show you today is that uh, we've done these jumps jump in two ways, right? I mean, one is to go from uh, mapping where this increased connectivity that results from two, humanization for 2C originates from. And now, now that at least we have a limited picture of this, but in the cortex, it seems that this increase for, uh, in layer two, three comes from short and long range cortical cortical con connections. That then we're trying to ask what are the uh, resulting emerging properties uh, in the response properties of those neurons, right? Following 2C uh, humanization. It, th those are difficult questions, right? And, and, and to, to, to link, but we, we hope that we're, 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 we're getting there uh, by, by doing this stepwise, basically. But there's much more work needs to be done, right? Very interesting question. Does the SARGAP2 expression in Macaulay's have something to do with synaptogenesis too? Absolutely. So, uh, so we're very interested in pursuing this question, uh, right? I mean, it's possible that, that uh, human cortical microglial cells are special in a sense, right? That they maybe have different phagocytic activity uh, during, during synaptogenesis or, or synaptic pruning, right? Uh, following the beautiful work from uh, Beth Stevens and, and others. Uh, we don't know, so so because we have both a conditional knockout for 2A and a, a conditional uh, expression system for 2C, uh, we're we're uh, starting to to probe um, SRGAP 2A and SRGAP 2C function in microglial cells using microglial uh, specific Cree drivers. And uh, stay tuned; there's, there's probably much more to come. We've also initiated a collaboration with um, Takao Henge uh, lab at uh, at Harvard, and. Uh, 
he, he has uh, some really tantalizing results also suggesting that uh, SRGAP2A plays a, fun a very interesting function in, in microglial cells. Uh, in, in the context of uh, synaptic pruning during uh, critical periods. So there's a lot more um, work coming coming online, uh, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. There's another question about um, um, saying, recently uh, human layer 2, 3 parameter neurons were shown to express dendritic calcium spikes. Um, uh, this is work from uh, from the Harnett lab, uh, I believe, and also from uh, I think Matthew Larkham's lab. Uh, or uh, so do humanized rodent layer two three show this the same activity? So uh, yes. So I would I would I, we don't know yet. I mean that's something we're very interested in 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 probing, of course, um, specifically because we see this increase, um, uh, you know, this significant forty percent increase in in uh, cortical cortical um, inputs coming onto the apical dendrites of those layer two, three parameter neurons. Um, one limitation of our work, of course, is that those neurons are, are not much larger, right? There, there, there might be some, some change in dendritic arborization in those neurons that we're currently quantifying, but, but in essence, they're not larger, right? What, what's special about human layer two, three parameter neurons is layer two, three in humans, in primates in general, but in particular in humans, has expanded tremendously, right? The total number of, of neurons dedicated to layer two, three in the human cortex is much larger, right? Making layer two three, in fact, much larger. So those neurons have a much longer layer two three parameter. Uh, layer two three parameter neurons in humans have a larger apical dendrite, right? Longer apical dendrite, which almost makes them like layer five uh, mouse parameter neurons, right? So it would be amazing if the if if those neurons. Um, when we humanize for 2C, change their dendritic integration properties, for example, by, uh, by having uh, emergent uh, dendritic calcium spikes, um, active dendritic uh, um, calcium spiking. It's something we're actually very interested in for an unrelated project in CA1 parameter neurons, but we're, we're very, very, very interested. We don't know yet. It's a very, very good question. Um, there's a question regarding the increased proportion of inhibitor synapses on spines in humans. Did you look at uh, the source of those? No, we haven't. Uh, th this is a very good question. We don't know where, where, why those neurons, the, when we humanize for 2C, uh, increase very significantly the fraction of duly innervated spines, so spines that receive both excitatory and inhibitory uh, connections. Um, as you might know, there is some suspicion in the literature suggesting that um, that the, the spines that receive this dual innervation, right, that, that, that receives both excitatory, the spines are preferentially innervated by uh, thalamic uh, inputs, uh, some of the thalamic inputs I, I, I mentioned today. So uh, why would you increase the fraction uh, of inhibition onto the spines is, is unknown to us, but it, you know, it might participate to changes in circuit uh, architecture and circuit function. Uh, something we, we would love to explore, but we haven't we haven't done that. Very good question. So th the next question is very interesting. Are there any human specific duplication in, in the robust sleet family? So as far as you can tell, no. There there are no um, there, there there's there's none. So that we're 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 sure about this. That said, we're fascinated by the possibility that um, SR gap two is a Humans, SRGAP2C is a human specific modifier of uh, the synaptogenic activity of robo in particular, because you know, if, 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 the, the way I see this now that, that this work is emerging in the lab is that it's very likely that this gene has emerged um, not simply as a, as a broad, um, uh, as I thought before, as a broad modifier of all synapse, uh, synapse, synaptic development. It seems to promote the formation of, of very specific classes of inputs and, and change connectivity in, in, um, in, in a synapse-specific way. So the reason why, why robo slit in this context is very interesting, I, I didn't want to uh, show you any sort of, uh, to speculate too much, but there is actually a very, very interesting literature emerging, it's sort of spotty, but, but I think it uh, depicts a very interesting emerging picture, uh, stemming from, from two main directions. The first one is that, um, uh, 
Eric Jarvis lab at uh, Rockefeller here who studies um, uh, uh, songbird um, and the circuits involved in, in uh, song production and, and, and song, uh, song learning in songbirds um, has uh, published evidence suggesting that robo and slit actually uh, are uh, differentially expressed in, 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 in those circuits involved in, in uh, song, uh, song production before and, and after um, uh, song learn, the animals, those birds learn those songs, suggesting that, that, um, that, that, those, uh, that those genes, both robo and sleet actually might be, um, you know, playing a role in, in maybe some of the circuit uh, level plasticity that, that is required for uh, song production. And, and in, in, in his, the, he published a recent review in Science where he, he proposes tantalizing uh, potential functions for slit by looking at slit expression in the adult human brain uh, using the Allen Brain Atlas and claims that uh, slit one is expressed in, in regions uh, similar to bird, basically, that, that, are, that are orthologous, basically, um, for um, language production, language uh, and, and, and speech learning. So, you know, time will tell. It's possible that, that um, in, in human, uh, sleep wobble are, are, are also expressed in, in um, you know, in key circuits um, involved in, in language production. This is, this is still far-fetched at this point. Um, the second line of evidence that's very interesting is that Robo 2 and Slit 2, there's a, a published um, evidence from the, uh, I believe, uh, Philip Kajewski's lab, uh, suggesting that um, uh, Robo, and Slit, Robo 2 and Slit 2 gene in humans show clear signs of positive selection. Uh, time will tell, uh, but it's, it's possible. Are there any change in vascular density or neurovascular cotton? It's a very interesting uh, question. We, we haven't looked at this. Um, we, we, we're actually, uh, uh, Eva Schmidt in the lab, in collaboration with Elizabeth Hillman, as, as you know, Elizabeth has, uh, uh, you know, uh, really great interest in studying neurovascular coupling in, in the cortex. Um, where uh, Eva has done um, a large body of work uh, using in, uh, Intrinsic optical imaging um, and 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 um, uh, image neuronal response properties in the entire cortex of uh, two C animals compared to wild type. Um, when we do those experiments, in, in, you know, the first thing we do is that we remove, we filter out basically the, the vascular signal uh, that that, um, that that you can get. So, uh, but but it's something we could look at. Actually, it's very interesting. Um, there's another question. Increased on responses during risk assimilation implies changes in the early processing from the thalamus, layer two, three to layer four to layer two, three. The connectivity didn't seem too different in those places. Can't go back and check. Uh, do the connectivity and functional results corroborate? Well, you know, we would love to 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 be able to tell that the connectivity and functional results uh, corroborate. The on response, the increase in, in the fraction of on responses uh, might originate from uh, feed forward uh, projection from layer two, from layer four to layer two, three, which, by the way, is increased very significantly. It's about 50% increase in, in uh, based on our monosynaptic tracing experiments. Um, and so it, 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 it could, right? It's a difficult proposition, of course, right? Interpretation. Uh, what we're currently trying to do in the lab is, is in the 2C animals, um, tune down uh, layer four neuron act, uh, activity in, in, and, and test if, um, if uh, the increase in on responses now is, is toned down to really nail the fact that this increase in the fraction of on the probability of on responses really truly originates from layer four inputs, the increased uh, inputs from layer four, or it could originate. There's also increased inputs from layer five, monosynaptic inputs from layer five, or even this long-range uh, uh, feedback projections. We 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 don't know. It's a, it's a difficult question for sure. Um, yes. There's a there's a question uh, saying, "Great job! Uh, will there be any advantage to use animal models like non-human primates to test?" Uh, well, yes. Uh, you, you've probably read that there's quite a bit of debate on whether or not that's uh, that's ethical, right? To humanize non-human primates. I mean, we're very tempted to use. Uh, we've we've been, you know. Uh, thinking about using marmosets, for example, in, 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 this, uh, in this context. Um, I think it would be fascinating. Uh, 
um, yes, I, I, I think it would be fascinating whether it's, you know, it comes down to, to, to the ethics of, of uh, doing this manipulation in, 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 this, uh, in these animal models. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think other labs are, are currently, you know, doing genetic manipulation in, in, uh, of that sort, right, in, in macaques and, and marmosets. Uh, time will tell. I, I think we have enough to learn using combination of the mass model um, and um, loss of function in human neurons that we graft in mouse, right? So this is a beautiful system, the, the system that I mentioned from, from Pierre Van Ergen. I, I think there's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge to be acquired from this, right? And in the exact relationships between um, this, this, at the molecular synaptic level, what those human specific modifiers do to circuit function and maybe circuit performance and trying to make uh, causal bridges between these different levels of, exp uh, of, of um, exploration, I, I think is, is, is already difficult. Uh, does the sargap to c uh, affect uh, cortical folding and its consequences? No, there's no effect, as far as we can tell, there's no effect on folding, there's no effect on, on radioglial uh, proliferation. Um, there might be an effect on, on the rate of migration of those neurons. That, that's something we reported earlier. Um, but we saw that only when we did mosaic expression of 2C or loss of function of 2A. When we transgenically express the gene in, in, or mark out the gene in all parameter neurons in the cortex, we don't see a change in, in migration. But certainly no effect on cortical folding. In line with to the question, what happens at the behavioral level for two C mice? Yeah, uh, are there any behavioral assessment reported? Well, we're doing those experiments as we speak, as I briefly uh, mentioned before. Those are not easy experiments to do, uh, especially if you want to find an, a clear and quantitative improvement in behavioral performance. Uh, but uh, we have this result I, I didn't have time to show you. Um, suggesting that um, humanization for 2C uh, very significantly increased performance in a sensory uh, discrimination task, which, which we think is very interesting. Maybe the last question. Do you have any comments on, on that cultured human stem cell derived won't make robust dendritic spines, also, uh, although there's supposedly expressed human even version of synaptic genes? Yes, so, so that's a very interesting question. I, I strongly believe that the culture system, unlike uh, grafting those neurons back in the mouse cortex, right, uh, such as um, with what uh, the lab of Pierre van Ergen has done, clearly suggests that there's something profound lacking in culture um, that, that could be for, of two natures. The first one is that, as you probably saw from Pierre's lab, those, those parameter neurons are remarkably neotenic, right? In even after grafting, it takes, you know, four, three, four, six months for those neurons to form spines, right? And and even the spine density that you, you reach after, let's say, six to nine months post-grafting um, is still not quite adult-like based on, on the spine density measurements we, we have, you know, in, in, in normal human brain. So it really suggests that, that those, those neurons are exceedingly slow at, uh, at, uh, at synaptic maturation, right? And what controls that is a fascinating question, right? But the, the fact is that in vivo, post-grafting is the only condition I know of where those neurons actually form spines and fully integrate synaptically. So clearly even a mouse cortex contains factors uh, that promotes ma spine maturation morphologically and functionally that are not present in, in culture, making culture models, I think. E even though, interestingly, those neurons, as you probably know, those pyramidal neurons, human pyramidal neurons cultured in, in, in 2D, right, in, in, uh, do form synapses. So, so they form synapses, but not spines, which is, I find completely fascinating. It, it, I don't think anybody knows at this point why not. Uh, but it, it's a big difference, and that's why we're we're very keen on on using the the, the xenografting system that that Pierre and again has developed because it's a, it's a beautiful way to uh, to study um, synaptic maturation and, and 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 circuit integration in a in in vivo setting. Right. All right. Thank you all. So I, I think this is. Let me, oh yeah, because I have to call. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Well, you have to call to talk to me, but uh, we, we've all heard you and uh, we appreciate <laughs> yes. it. Yes. I want to thank all of you for first for staying this late and and um, and for all those, those, those great questions. I, uh, I really enjoyed this. Um, I, I think it makes us rethink about, you know, scientific communication in, in general. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic format to, to you know, to exchange uh, scientific information and share uh, information that uh, circumvents physical location, right? So, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, participating and uh, using all means available to communicate with your with your public. Um, so um, next week, same day, same time. So Thursday, uh, I have a blank now. Five p.m. Uh, Geneva time, and it's going to be Bastien Martin from the Institut Savoie Pinier, newly named uh, Paris Brain Institute, that is going to tell us about stochasticity, development, and individuality. So I strongly encourage you to to attend uh, and, and hope to see you there. Bye-bye, Thank everyone. you all. Bye-bye. Thank you, Denis. So you can stay or...